Well, uh, welcome to the session of this afternoon on uh, risk measure. Um, I'm Alejandro Jofre, one of the co-chair of this uh, conference. And Tito is, uh, is organizing this, this, the sport activity this afternoon. And uh, maybe he may be even he's playing soccer, I think. <laughs> but uh, well, we have, uh, have a pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Alex Chapiro. You know uh, him very well. Alex has been very active and for a long time and in uh, the stochastic programming community, but not only in optimization, but also in the statistic. So uh, today he's going to talk about uh, uh, risk measure, and uh, we are planning a one hour and a half session and then a break, and we will see later, okay? okay. Wait and see, so right? Thank you. So the, the plan is that we will have session a uh, one and a half hour, until four o'clock, then we'll have break, half an hour, and then we'll sit. So first I have to apologize because uh, it's a big sacrifice for people coming here instead of playing tennis or soccer, I suppose. Right? And second is uh, there will be some formulas in my presentation. I'm sorry about that, but other, I don't know how to do it otherwise. Okay. Okay. So let's start. Now, uh, you, uh, I believe this morning was just a basic uh, tutorial about stochastic optimization, stochastic programming. So I'll start building that. And uh, the two approaches, how to make generalization or extension to that. One approach, and it existed for a very long time, is that when we look at optimization, we have objective function. Right? I'm talking about static problems, a two-stage. You can think about that as the value of the second stage, the decision variable and some randomness. And if I want to, say, minimize the expected value of that right, on average, I, I have to specify distribution, probability measure of this, how to do that. In reality, of course, all we have is data, and we have to model it somehow. Right? No model is perfect. So the idea is that, OK, when we talk about that, and we have this, if I, if I want just to write mathematically what is that just to make sense, I have to say what probability distribution I have here. For simplicity, you can think about that as a random vector, if you wish, or an ele element of probability space, more abstract way. Right? And this is a pro this some probability measure that we assume about this randomness. How to model it is not simple. And this uh, maybe we say, OK, we don't have just one distribution. But we have, have a whole family of distributions, more than one. How to construct this family, also a good question, right? But we look at the worst possible case. We, here we talk about minimization problem, or generally I'll talk minimization problem. So we say the nature working against us, and from the whole family of possible distributions, it will choose the worst possible one. We take the maximum of that, and then we minimize that with respect to decision parameters. It has very long history. Right? We'll, later, we'll talk ab about that more. This one possible approach. It goes back at least, I don't know, 50 years back. Okay. Another possible approach is why we optimize, why we minimize that on average. Right? The particular realization that we will have can be very different from the average. Right? If we are not lucky, it can be bad. So how to control the risk of that? And it also has the concept of the risk, another very long history, going centuries back. Okay. So if I just, even mathematically, I want to formulate something like that, I have to say, this is my random variable. It depends on the decision x. And there is a particular realization of that this uncertainty here, I have to assign to that a certain number. 
right? For one of the popular models that also going back something like this, you go Markowitz type of model. I want to call on one hand, I want probably to talk on this on average. I want to minimize the average, but I also want to control some sense risk of that. And the very popular way how people do it statistically measure risk by variability or variability by variance or sta rather standard deviation. Okay? So if you know this famous Markowitz model, uh, which was uh, revolutionary 50, 60 years ago in finance, uh, they tried to reach a compromise, maximizing the profit on average and to control the risk by minimizing this, putting some weight or penalty on variability of that. Okay? So, and for very long time, these two approaches existed completely different. Right? There was no connection between them. So, at least 50, 60 years. Now, uh, there's a, then this very famous paper. You can see the, the time, right? This by these four authors. And this came from uh, financial applications motivated, motivated by finance, where the people are very much concerned about the risk. Okay? They said, OK, if I want to define this risk measure, how I measure the risk, it should satisfy the certain conditions, axi oxy axioms. Mm -hmm. right? And what are natural axioms should be? And they identified these four axioms. So first of all, what is that? Right? It's defined generally on a certain type of outcomes or random variables. We'll later we'll have some technical, technical details how we can really do that. And that should satisfy these conditions. Uh, the first condition is convexity. So when I have two random variables, and if I look at the random variables as just measurable functions on a certain probability space, I, I can add them together. I can add them, I can multiply, they form certain linear space. This is a certain type of model in that. Right? So it's very natural that my risk measure should be linear with respect, uh, sorry, convex with respect. In particular, if I'll take expected value of that, it's linear, there will be equality here. So we replace here equality of expectation, expected value is integral, by convexity. Okay? This is a big step. Why I say this? It's, it turns out to be natural from many points of view. In optimization, convexity is everything, right? When I try to solve numerical problems. It also makes sense from the point of view of diversification of the portfolio. All right. Now, the really important, the other very important property is monotonicity. This is very natural. It makes complete uh, common sense. So if I have two possible outcomes, right, these are random variables. You can think about these outcomes. Remember, we talk about here minimization. I used to convex pro rather than concave function. So let's talk about minimization. Then it should ne it's very naturally that this um, risk measure that I assigned to this random variable should be bigger than, not greater than or equal than this one. It should be monotone. Okay. It turns out that the Markowitz model, which is, uh, gets certain combination between expected value and variance or standard deviation doesn't satisfy this property, which is strange, right? And uh, this, because of that, sometimes it's possible to construct an example with Markowitz model. I didn't define what is there, but if you know, okay, which produce results again against common sense. You have two possible out outcomes. One is always better than the other for all possible realization, and yet this model pick up a wrong one. So this is very natural condition. Then this is also, for many reasons, unnatural. If I add uh, this constant to that, it's just move everything by the same constant. And this one saying this, if I, in finance example, if I have $1 and I distribute it in investment, or if I have a million dollars, I distribute it proportionally to that. It's very natural. 
right? So it turns out, so this, these conditions were motivated by these people by, again, by financial application, but it turns out that from point of view of convex analysis, this is very natural. And it leads to some very natural conclusions mathematically. So it's a very big success in that sense. And the result is says the following. There's a certain duality. Duality is going back, long way back, right, in classical function analysis and optimization and so on. Let me say a few words about that. Uh, again, I apologize. I'll have to write certain formulas. Okay. Now, first of all, uh, when I define this risk measure, okay, and here it's still abstraction. I'll, go, I'll show you examples. I have to specify on what class of random variables it makes sense. For technical reasons, it's not possible to define it in a meaningful way on all possible outcomes. In other words, if you have probability theory, have some prob uh, sample space, I can see probability space, I consider all possible random variables, and I'll try to assign to this risk measure in that sense, it will not, it's not possible. So one, I have to restrict it in some reasonable way. So from a theoretical point of view and also from practical point of view, it's very natural as a statistician, right? I say, okay, I will consider random variable which have finite fifth order moment, say first order moment, right? You know, if you had class and probability, if you take Cauchy distribution, for example, doesn't have the mean. So it's very natural to restrict it. So the space that we have to consider, this is uh, this, I will be in abstract way, our probability space, and we consider all random variable such that it has finite if or the moment. P can be one to infinity. Inf if I'll talk, take infinity, it's maximum of that, or essential maximum, essential surprise. It's very natural for implication point of view, right? No, in statistics, it's all the stuff that people talk. And also convenient mathematically. Why it's convenient mathematically? Because if I want uh, to talk about some type of duality, and this is what I'll show you, is very basis of all of that, I have to, to consider two spaces. I, I need to define what is people call scalar product. And uh, when you have finite dimensional phase, say Rn, and you look at the standard scalar product, your dual space in the, say, the same Rn, same finite dimensional space. Now you take the usual scalar or it's a product that has several names. Dot product, it has the, sa the same thing. When we go to infinite dimensional, one should be more careful. So you say, okay, why well, I need the infinite dimensional here? Maybe it will be all can be described in finite dimensions. What I mean the finite dimensions, that if I look at my space, if I take my, this, my space, this is omega. This is a set of elementary events, finite. Then I'll have discrete distributions. And many, really many laws in probability and statistics already can be demonstrated on that. The problem with that is that some of the very important properties will not hold there. And also, it will be very restrictive from application point of view. For example, normal distribution will be eliminated. It's not discrete. A normal distribution is very important in statistics and application. So I will have to deal that a little bit with this infinite dimensional spaces. I ask you not to be afraid of that, right? It's a, uh, you will see what I'm saying will be, make a lot of sense. And I will not go too much in technical details. Nevertheless, I need to define that what is called scale, scalar product. And when we have finite dimensional, it's a sign, I take two vectors, I have two vectors, finite dimensional vectors, I take product of coordinates and I add it together. When we go to more continuous distribution and infinite, I have to take integral. Integral like a sum. Now you see why it's like that, because it came from S, sum, okay? So, if I do that, I, if I look, and this is called dual space of that in functional analysis, it's also of that type, only this is different. So if I'll take P, for example, 
two, it's called Hilbert space, then dual of that will be the same space. But generally, it's not convenient to do that. Sometimes it will be just one. I'll show example when it's very natural to, to take it p equal to one, the first moment. The dual of that will be in L infinity space, for example. So the duality between these two. If I want to define some dual result, I need that. Without that, I cannot do anything. Okay? Okay? So uh, the moment I have that, right, we have this very strong duality relation. It's a classical result, which was known in functional analysis, I don't know for how many, maybe for centuries, right? and was very discovered by this type of applications. And it says the following. Right? If I each of these axioms, okay, in, in turn, define a certain property of this in this dual space. The main thing here is this convexity. I have this, the start with the convexity. Right? If I have that, I have this, this, I have this result. This is a famous fenchel moreau theorem. And the fenchel moreau theorem relates to this case when we will have only this, if we have only convexity of that and define as a function, functional, and certain functional space, right? if it is in some sense continuous or more up general lower semi-continuous, right, then we have this result that there's a sort of certain co conjugate function, so conjugate function of that, and we have the dual certain dual representation. If you see it first time, it's not easy. In fact, I will not use it. Okay? I will consider this more specific case. The specific case when we have all these axioms. And the, the technical thing here, yeah? uh, if I have convexity and monotonicity, and this my functional, I define real value. In other words, it doesn't take values plus infinity. If you had a class on optimization, very often you put, when uh, mathematically it's very convenient to get rid of the constraint, say, okay, I give infinite penalty to my objective function. I say it's plus infinite. Mathematically it's very convenient, but it's, hid it's give certain hidden constraint in your problem. From operational point of view, it's not very good, in fact. Because of that, uh, we considered here these risk measures. We, we try, uh, it's natural to try to avoid to give it plus infinity value. Because by doing that, when I uh, later I'll do minimization, it put additional hidden constraints in that, which is very difficult to handle numerically. And there are some other technical things that show that it's not really good approach. Right, as I'll try to explain to you. Okay? So it turns out, and this is a technical result, that if, I, if this, I have these two properties, convexity and monotonicity, and the function is real valued, it's assigned to each of that real number, not plus or minus infinity that they often, then it automatically apply that it's this continuous in uh, this uh, new norm topology of that. And then we have this result. Okay? I, uh, when I deal with this, uh, it's with this, well, again, with real valued risk functions, real numbers, right? I don't have to worry about this low semi-continuum or things like that. It's automatic. And it turns out that actually all interest in, practically all interest in examples of that the all is a space you can define natural space on which it will be real valued. The, I don't need this plus infinity. Okay? So you see this result, what it says. It's connect these two seemingly completely different approaches to sto the stochastic optimization. It turns out that this risk, this risk measure is satisfied these axioms, and this authors call it coherent such a risk measure, so I'll use this terminology, then actually these two sides of the same coin by duality. In other words, if I'll take some set of probability measures, which are 
there exists some reference probability measure, this P. Okay. There exists reference probability measure, which usually in modeling it is like that, not always. All right. Okay. Then I can consider a set of densities with respect to that probability measure. It's absolutely continuous with respect to densities. Right? Then I have this result that I can represent this risk measure as a maximum of that. This mu uh, have a certain type of densities. And these densities, these are functions of my probability space, live in the dual space. This is a technical thing. But from optimization point, from intuitive point of view, it's a very natural thing to think about it. And other way around, if I define certain set of densities in the dual space, bounded, it, it automatically gives me a coherent risk measure. So there's one-to-one -one relation between these two. So when I talk later, well, I'll talk risk-averse optimization, when I try to also to control the risk, or I, when we talk about distributionally, what today people call distributionally robust, when we don't know the distribution and we take the worst possible case, in some sense, they're equivalent. They, of course, the difference is how one constructs either the set, either the set of these corresponding densities, or how one defines the corresponding risk measure. From practical point of view, of course, it's very important. Theoretically, we have the duality relation between them. One is all the one can consider this, the one, and they consider. And this is actually a very productive way on looking the whole thing, as we'll see. Okay. Now, the most important are this class of coherent risk measures are this. If they have different names. They were discovered and rediscovered by many people. In some form, this was discovered by economists about 100 years ago, as I know, all right? in different forms. This is variational, uh, this representation, I think, due to Rockefeller and Uriasif relatively recently. But there are different forms of that. And it's a coherent risk measure. If, uh, this, if uh, one make minimization of that, the Solution of that will be what is people call value at risk in finance. So basically, this in statistics is called quantile. Now, when you have the distribution, this it can be more than one quantile. It's called the whole interval. So it will be whole interval of that. Okay. Uh, in some, it's also there is a, some difference. Sometimes people put one minus alpha here, but it's not important how one define that. Okay. The proof of that is rather simple by different computer in its optimality condition. Now, why this is so important? Why this is, in very many ways, this is really most natural coher uh, this coherent risk measure for several reasons, okay? Now, this is just different representations of that. Again, in that form, what it says, one take this highest quantiles of that and average them in some sense. This is the way how this economist discovered them. It has many different names. Some it's called conditional value at risk and many other names because it was discovered and discovered many people. This is also a very interesting interpretation of that. It's whole true if it is continuous distribution. Okay. Now, uh, why this is imp this important and natural in some sense? One way of looking at that, it gives certain approximation of chance constraint problems. I don't know if this, this morning you've been talking about chance or probabilistic constraints. It's very natural, right? You say, okay, I cannot enforce my constraint for all possible realization, but I want the bad things happens with small probability. And uh, you can see this, this, is, uh, this condition is equivalent to this condition. And this condition, if you all have here some function, is called probabilistic or chance constraint. No force parameters. This is, I choose, let's say, 5% or something like that. I want the bad things. It's bigger than that. It happens with small probability. It's possible to write it uh, as using value at risk or quantile in that form. It's equivalent. So 
Right in chance constraint, I can now use the quantile of value at risk instead of this chance probabilities. Now, the point is, if I go back, one of the points is because you see this, the solution of that is exactly this type of this quantile, one of possible solution. This is always bigger, or at least not smaller than corresponding value at risk. So if instead of that, instead of this constraint here, I will put average value at risk. I'll call it average value at risk, right? It gives me a conservative approximation of the chance constraint. The huge difference between these two is the chance constraint is very difficult to solve. Right? Also been some progress. And when I take value, average value at risk is convex. It's conve make convexification of that. So it's one point of view. I will not talk very much about that. So it's one way of looking at it. In fact, it's possible to show in some sense this average value at risk is the this, this tightest possible convex conservative approximation of these chance constraints. OK. Now, as I said, it, now if you look at that, if you look at this, for example, in that form, you can see it's very naturally that this leaves in L1 space. What I mean L1 space? In order for that to be finite-valued, I need to assume that this here has finite first-order moment. All right? And if it is not, it will be not really well-defined. This, If I'll have very heavy tails, and they have it else that means the mean probably expect really doesn't exist like in a Cauchy distribution. It's really not well defined for that. And in fact, because we take expected value of that, it's very sensitive to tails of the distribution. Again, uh, probably I will say later some, I'll show you some results of that type. Okay. Now, uh, so if what I want to say that now, this, it's very natural that it will live in that space. The dual of that space, this L infinity, this, this is uh, random variables which are bounded or essentially bounded, right? And uh, there's a very, very natural dual representation of that. The corresponding dual space of densities should be the, in, this densities should live in the dual space, and you can see they are bounded here by this. In particular, if I'll take alpha equal to 1, the only possible solution because of that will be constantly equal to 1. And for alpha equal, alpha equal to 1, we'll get expected value. So one extreme case of average value at risk is just expected value. The other ex extreme case that if uh, it will go to 0, no, if you look at the definition of that, I have to divide it. So divide by 0 is not a good idea. But I can go to the limit. If I go to the limit, it will be maximum. No, it's essential super is basically the maximum of that. Okay? So I have the whole spectrum here of risk measures between expected value and the maximum. And I take maximum of my random. This another way why it's natural. Okay? So there's some other examples of. And this is the first example is basically Mar Markowitz model. No, in Markowitz model, one do maximization, prof profit level minimization, but this is essentially it is. We take certain a combination between expected value and the variance. And this constant here is just a compromise between these two. Uh, it's convex. And it has, because of that, it has dual representation. But the corresponding is dual. It will, be, it will not be. Uh, non-negative. And uh, because of that, this, is, this risk measure, this Markowitz type of risk measure, does not satisfy monotonicity condition. This is what I mentioned from the beginning. One can say, oh, it's variance. And we add two different things here. This is expect value. It's one unit. Variance is square of that. So I can take square root of that and take standard deviation, which people usually do. It doesn't help. It still will not satisfy this, the corresponding monotonicity condition. So from this point of view, it's not natural. In some sense, not natural. The other large class of this type of examples, this one, maybe I'll say about that, 
And you see what, it's, what is the big difference between these two. When I look at the variance or standard deviation, it penalizes when the particular realization, this is random variable, remember this, that it has particular realization, this is what you observe. It can be bigger than expected value, it can be smaller. When I, make, when I minimize something, right, it's okay if it is, will be smaller. If I maximize some, my profit, if my profit is much bigger than average, I'll be happy. I don't want it to be smaller than that. I don't want to lose too much. Right? When, and this penalizes that in some sense, deviation from expected value both ways, symmetrical, which is not natural from this point of view. So you see this type of measures one-sided. And indeed, it's possible to show that this is coherent for if c is uh, between 0 and 1. Okay? And this, it's possible to write dual representation of that. It's a little bit technical. Now, what it says so far is nice. But, and again, this is going a long way back. How we model random variable, randomness, random variable. Before 20th century, people talk about uh, conditional distribution, uh, this is uh, cumulative distribution functions, for example. In other words, you look at you, what you observe is that uh, outcomes of your random experiments or observation and all that. And in principle, you look at the distribution of that, where it, uh, the chances where it could be. Then Kolmogorov came, and he built a model you know, based on measure theory. When these random variables, from his point of view, is just measurable function on, probabilities, on measurable space, on probability space. Right? How they are related to the, these two? Uh, from, when I look at that from the point of view of mathematical analysis, it's much more easy, much more natural to talk about that as a function of probability space, because then I can add them naturally, I can multiply them by a scalar, they form a linear space. If I look at the distribution function of sum of two even independent ra random variables, it's quite complicated in convolution. Right? So, but how they're related? When we talk about this construction of the underlying probability space, it's very mathematically convenient right to mathematically, but it's, uh, it's abstraction. In reality, we do not observe that. What we observe is outcomes of that. Right? So when I define this uh, risk measure on this corresponding outcomes on this linear space where I can add them all together, it's very convenient mathematically. But in, in many cases, I should think about it, what it means. So from this point of view, it's very natural okay, to think about what people call law invariant. Law, it's like distribution or distributionally invariant. What it means is that I have here my reference probability measure. This is my model, right? Reference measure, we are you. And I look at two random variables, okay? They, the construction can be different from this point, but they have, may have the same distribution. It's very natural that when I measure the risk of them, it should be the same. It should not depend on a particular realization of my random variable. And such risk measures are called low invariant. And actually, all interesting, it's possible to construct an example which is not low invariant, but actually, all interesting examples of that type are this of that. Average, all, all examples that I showed you are like that. Right? So it's very natural to consider it as like that. If I do that, right, and I restrict only my, what I consider the so-called low invariant risk measures, I can do much more than before. And it's very natural. In particular, when I look at that, right, I can think about that now is that only depend not on the particular realization, but on the corresponding distribution. It's function of the corresponding cumulative distribution function. It's very, very important, actually, and it allows to do much more than before. So one should think about that. Now, uh, this is technical result. Okay? Suppose that my probability distribution, probability uh, the space is what people call 
non-atomic or atomless. In other words, it does not have atoms. Atom is the sort of one point where it has positive mass. For example, discrete distribution of all atoms. But in many, in it's very in many ways, it's natural to say, I don't have uh, these atoms. I don't have these points with positive mass. This is, it, it's a somewhat little bit technical assumption. One can go around that, but suppose it's true. Then, because it all depends on, uh, when you talk about low invariant function, it depends on the distribution. And I can move it all to some very simple case. Let's call it standard. In other words, I can consider my probability space just interval 0, 1. Right? I assign to this, you know, this technical sig sigma algebra just Borel said, and I look at that uniform distribution. The moment I do that, I construct the probability space. It's interval 0, 1. The reference distribution is uniform. Right? And if I do like that, what is a random variable defined? That? Random variable is simply function defined, a real value function defined on interval 0, 1. It should be measurable with respect to that, what I say. It's very technical, but it's not essential at the moment. What it means that then two a random variable has the same distribution. That means that I can transform one into another, but making some mapping of this change in this interval 0, 1, such that it preserves the measures. In fact, it's true for any atomless space. If I do that, it's sim everything enormously simplified. Why? Because now, if I have some random variable z, right, it has cumulative distribution function. For any random variable, I have cumulative distribution function with respect to reference probability measure. I can look at the quantile of this. What is this in the quantile of this? This, this, this defines it's, it's monotonically, right? If this omega here, you should remember that omega here is number between 0 and 1. It's a function defined on interval 0, 1. It's monotonically increasing function, not decreasing. And one can think about the right side continuous. So it follows from this result that if I have random variable defined on this 0, 1, it's distributionally equivalent to its uh, this quantile function. In other words, what I can do, I have, z you can imagine if you, 0, 1, you have some function of that measurable. I can transform that by making this permutation type of things to monotonically increasing function, say right continuous, and this will be exactly this one, the corresponding quantile. So it's distributionally equivalent. Because of that, because of that, when I have this, the, this result, that I showed you before can be written in that form, right? Very specific form. Where what it's this? You see that a, this this is I have now interval zero one. This is just random variable, and that it's a function, measurable function. Okay? This is a, a leaf in a dual space, right? Which is also the simply densities on the interval, and I have the maximum of them. This is the result that I showed you written for this specific case, this dual result. But it's more to that, because I always can move it to this part of that. And this is a, this, it's usually called spectral functions. This is a basically density. It's monotonically non-decreasing. I always can this. And this is non-negative. It's in all integral equal 1. So this, in some sense, is density, total integral equal to 1 with respect to the uniform distribution, OK? And I can use, uh, assume that right side continues. So what is written here? Nothing else but this duality result that I showed you from the beginning. But it's more to that, OK? So because of that, what I said right, is I can, if I have low invariance, I can transform that to this form. I can transform it to this form, where this is just quantile function or value at risk, how people call. And this is certain set of these spectral functions. This is called, called generated set, generating set. 
In particular, it can happen that this generating set will consist from one function. This fun such function are called, such risk measures are called spectral. All right? it's, in other words, I have many of them, but they all can be moved by distribution equivalence to just one, which is that monotonic equation. And this is exactly value trees of quanta. And there are many examples of this, okay? We have this important class of spectral risk measures. So what is written here? Yeah, nothing more than just the duality result that I showed you from the beginning for low invariant risk measures. All right? Basically, it's fenchel moreau theory, or suppose this. Okay. Now, know this. Uh, it's a question of this uniqueness of that. There's uh, some technical details. Uh, probably I will skip it. Okay. Now, why this? Why this is another reason why it's so important. This in natural. And uh, here I use it's one minus alpha. It's convenient or like that, right? Remember this, it's one of the possible representation of that. If you look at that, it's a particular case of this, right, where this corresponding spectral function is a stepped function. Very simple. Zero, constant on zero, one. It's very natural, right? It's probably the uh, simplest one possible when you have piecewise constant, just two constant. And average value at risk, exactly like that where this is a just indicating the function of this interval, right? It's equal to one for all values between this, and otherwise it's zero. So again, you have up zero, constant. And then we have this corresponding representation. Now, when I have this type of thing, so I can consider this average value risk for different values of the significance level alpha, and I can take convex combination of them. This what is written is a convex combination. This, uh, this are non-negative numbers summing up to one. Convex combination of coherent risk measures, again, coherent risk measures. It's not difficult to show. So what is written here is, again, spectral risk measures, where spectral risk measure with the corresponding spectral function is step function. It's just linear convex combination, what we had before. Okay. So it's again spectral risk measure. Here I have convex combination. Next step, I can take integral of that instead of that. Okay. The moment I take integral, I will have the corresponding general form of spectral risk measures. And uh, how it's related to the, this representation that I, this original, this dual representation that I showed you here, right? Or this one. There is a simple linear transformation, a integral transformation, which show the connection between them. In other words, if I will take distribution, probability distribution, this is probability distribution and measure, probability measure is the same thing. Okay? Probability distribution on interval 0, 1, I will not include 1 here. There's no positive mass at 1. Right? Then I can consider this type of integral with respect to that. And it's not difficult to show that this will be spectral risk measure. Now it will monotonically increase with t, and the total integral will be equal to 1. It's just a computing double integrals of that. All right. It's possible to show all right, that this map, it's one-to-one -one correspondence by this mapping all right, from set of probability measures on in z to a set of spectral functions. It's one-to-one -one correspondent. So in principle, there's inverse of that, which can be also written in integral form. Okay, this is uh, just very simple. So what happens is that if I now look at that, remember, this is a spectral risk measure with this spectral function. By computing double integral, I'll come to that. So there's a relation between them. In other words, if I look at any spectral risk measure, of that, right, with one, I can represent it in the form of average value at risk. It's like basic blocks from which I can construct it by this, inf by this transformation, with this integral transformation. Okay? 
And this measure is simply given by inverse of that, which can be computed by this integral. It's a very simple thing. And it's very useful, as we'll see. In fact, right, I have probably more than one because we have maximum. So any coherent risk measure can be represented in that form. And uh, depending on what space we consider, this will, we will consider this, this will be restricted in some sense to some set of uh, possible distribution. This is called Kosoka representation. This Kosoka is Japanese uh, sign, uh, scholar, is probability that first introduced this type of ideas. Okay? So you see, this is, this is another importance of that, that actually all this coherent risk measure can be represented starting this block from that. And this is very convenient, actually, as we'll see, for many reasons. Okay? So I showed you just one example of this specific representation. This is a absolute, this is a absolute semi, called absolute semi-deviation. PE, remember this was P, P equal to 1. And this has this very specific, in this space, it's possible to compute explicitly. It's not always that explicit, but uh, you have the corresponding Kosoka representation. All right, it's given by that. And it's convenient for statistical analysis, as we'll see, for many other things. Okay. Now, uh, remember that uh, when we talk about that all, that uh, at the end of the day, we work with the data. Now I, I put my, statistic, my statistics head, and I want to see what will happen if I will try to compute this based on the data. I have the data. And based on this data, I can approximate my distribution by what's called empirical distribution. You can think about that sample and some sample of uh, this, uh, say, random vector or something, a uh, random variable. And I put mass of 1 over n, n is a sample size, each, at each of this point. It will be called empirical distribution or empirical cumulative distribution function. It's just step, such step function. When I have low invariance, when I have low invariance, this risk measure depends only on distribution. Because of that, I, if I replace my distribution by its empirical estimate, you see this is exactly what I'm saying, right? I will have very natural estimate of my risk measure. And I can do it for any one of low invariant risk measures that I measure and will come with some simple natural formulas. For example, if I will talk about average value at risk, if I replace that, it's simply, I simply average the integral. Very natural thing to do, right? And this will be estimate of this, which I can use based on the data. So the natural question, what will be the properties of that? All right, it's a statistical question. Now, it's possible to show that there's a, some statistical laws which true for expected value. The basic law of statistics, and probably um, actually all this laws of nature that we observe, law of large numbers. What law of large numbers saying? That if I have random variable, and I observe this in simple form, I ID sample of that, I have more and more data independent uh, with the same distribution, distribute uh, according to the distribution law independent of each other. If I average that, it converts in some probabilistic sense to expected value. This is law of large numbers. So it turns out that similar thing works, works here. There is a, some type of law of large numbers. In other words, and this, of course, in order to do that, I needed uh, this law invariance, because then it's only function of the distribution, and this very natural I can look at that. And uh, basically, there's a law of large numbers. There's a convergence of that. Uh, what is interesting that if I have value at risk or quantile, law of large numbers doesn't hold, is not, all, doesn't, is not always hold. Why? Because if I, this for true distribution, the whole interval is not unique. I can get into one point or another. It's not clear. Here I don't have this problem. 
these law of large numbers here. It's possible to show it's actually not that difficult. The next is that how fast it converge. So this basically law of large numbers say that with some probabilistic sense, if I have more and more data, I approximate my true this value of that better and better. It converge to that. But what about rate of convergence? How fast it converge? And the classical result in probability and statistics is central limit theory. So if I average my data, it converge this sample, that, sample average that I will have converged to the true mean at a rate of 1 over square root of the n. n is a sample size. Because of the central limit theorem, it converges the distribution to normal. This is actually very bad. But the rate of convergence is very slow, 1 over square root of n. Something like that is possible to show here. What is interesting that this type of results at certain point become very technical and very difficult. But for average value at risk, there is uh, some type of uh, result which is not that difficult and simply says that if I look this, my estimate of the true value of average value at risk, right, you make a think about it, some average. If I multiply by square root of n, remember square root of n is a rate. Then the conversion distribution to normal if this is unique, the corresponding quantile is unique. If it is not unique, it will be not asymptotically normal. And this is a very simple formula, actually, for that. Basically, what it says that the variance, this variance that I'll have for standard deviation, if you wish, it's more or less the same as if I look at variational formula and I put it constant here. The rate is basically the same type of thing. Now, uh, you can see, and the many claims of that is that when people do that, one can estimate this corresponding by simulation. What it means by simulation? Simulation means that if I have the true distribution of that, I can sample from this, say, in Monte Carlo. I generate large sample, and I simply take the corresponding, uh, replace it by the empirical. It will be corresponding average. I can compute it. It converges to that. And this is also used in some optimization technique. One thing should be remembered is that what about the variance of that variability? This, when we look at this, this right here, okay, you see that it also depends on this value here. When its value is close to zero, variance of that starts to go increase fast. It's very understandable. Because in some sense, it's approximation of the small probabilities. And if you want to simulate probability of order 10 to the minus 5, in order to see that, you need sample which is much bigger than million. So in other words, when it's very small, right, one cannot really compute that in re real reasonable time with reasonable accuracy by simulation. What should remember about this? And this, so, and also, this type of thing, this average value, is very sensitive to heavy tails, to outliers. It's very natural. Okay, no, there's a, some other examples. It's also, there's a, some type of uniform law of large numbers, which is important for optimization. I don't think I, uh, probably I will not say. But it's possible to show this, uh, this type of this ep ep epiconvergence type of things which is much more sophisticated result. In other words, also law of large numbers exist in some uniform way. When you do optimization, this is important. It's not enough just point-wise law of large numbers. One needs to something else. OK? Now, and this is basically what I'm saying. Uh, suppose I, I'm talking here about static problem. Right. I have a random variable depending on my decision x. You can see this is what is written. Here is this also omega here. I didn't write it. But it's random variable. For every decision variable x, it's random variable. And it's row defined on that. Right. If you take, for example, expected value, here it will be what people could say risk neutral formulation. One minimize the expectation. Here it's very natural. I can replace it by some risk. Okay. Now, 
if, I, if it is low invariant, I can replace this by the corresponding empirical distribution. And what I'll have, what the people say, it will be analog of sample average approximation method. It can be done for average, for any low invariant risk measure. And then it's possible to show that in G under some mild conditions, this uh, term uniform law of large numbers type, there's a convergence here. No convergence, of course, should be understood in probabilistic sense, say probability of one. Okay? They, such a result exists, so it's uh, quite sophisticated. Okay. Now, another point. So far, I really didn't have any dynamics of that. I didn't talk about any dynamics of that. It was very static. When I look at that, say, OK, this is a function dependent on x and probably random vector. I compute this risk measure. I probably can approximate it probably by sample average, especially the approximation, especially if it is mean, some type of convex combination between mean and the uh, a var. I can, it's causal do. They have these statistical properties and so on and so on. Now let's look at two-stage program. What is a two-stage? No, basically, you had, uh, I believe you, today you discussed that. What is the two-stage? There's a first-stage decision and there's second-stage decision. And at the second stage, you have this corresponding value of the second stage. This is the first stage decision, this is second, and there's randomness on that. So this is a value of the second stage decision. We wrote it in quite very abstract form. If it is linear, you have something like that. I believe you, I believe you discussed it this morning, right? And then I look at that. This is, I take the risk of this. This is my function. So. This is a very natural way. If, if I take the expected value of that, this will be standard two-stage problem. In case it's linear, it will be linear. Okay. Now, uh, if you know the two equivalent formulations of the, uh, this risk neutral case, when I look at this form, when I will look at this form that is the value of the second stage second stage decision, I put it there. Or I can formulate it as one large, say, linear program, linear program, if, if I have a finite number of these uh, realizations. And the equivalence of these two is based on interchangeability of the maximum or the minimum and the expectation. So, Think about, and this is a relatively simple thing. Think about that as expected value, particular case of that, expectation here. I minimize here certain uh, function, depending on that. If I do that, this optimal, suppose it has an optimal solution. It will be function, if, when I minimize that, it will be function of omega, this optimal of this, right? So what I can do instead, I can take all such possible functions and I optimize over functional space. So it's a well-known property for expectation. If I have expectation, if I want to change this expectation operator and minimum, I, have to do, I should do it that way. This was known in statistics for a long time and Bayesian statistics, they use that and all that. It's very, so something very similar exists also for risk measures. And uh, it's based on monotonicity properties, uh, property of that. So if I will do that, right, if I apply that, I can think about that in that form, minimization in that form, it will be equivalent to that. To that. So if, for example, this, this omega, this space possible outcomes is finite, just finite possible numbers, what you'll have is you'll have the vector of the corresponding dimension as many points as that. And this is a standard equivalence that you probably saw in this in tutorial about stochastic programming. Here, there's something very similar exists of that. In fact, in many things, there are many similarities between this at least theoretical properties between if I look the expected value or I look the risk. Okay, so this is a one property of that. Now, now I, I'll have to do, go to dynamics, which becomes much more involved. And some things that I'll say probably will be not very in, intuitive 
even, or contradict maybe just the in intuition of the people. Uh, suppose I have low invariant risk measure. Right? Remember this low invariant. And this is random variable. Suppose I have another random variable, y. Then I can talk about conditional distribution of this given that. It's not a trivial concept, right? But in elementary books, you have this whole discussion of conditional distribution. I would not go into the very technical details of that. But if I do that, right, I can define what people say conditional risk measure. By the way, this is one reason why I would not use conditional value at risk because it will be conditional analog of that. It will be strange, called conditional conditional, right? So average is better. So what I want to say that in principle, they technical details, yeah? but in principle for any low invariant risk measure, I can consider it's conditional analog. And I'll write it like that or like that. So this is one random variable conditional on the other. Why I need that? Because now I'll start to talk about dynamics. And when I talk dynamics, dynamical, multi-stage, it's all about that. Okay. Now, if I take here this expected value of that, which is particular case, and the expected value is linear with respect to that, then we have very natural property of expected value, this decom decomposition property. What it means that average of averages is total average. In other words, if I have one, right, and I conditional another, I, I take this whole set of numbers, I put different sets, I compute average of each subset, and the average that I'll get back to this. Another way of looking, it's Fubini theorem, if you know what it is. So expect value has this very natural property of that. Okay? It turns out that risk measures don't have this property, current risk measures. Okay? And in fact, maybe I should say it's here, the only low invariant coherent risk measure that say has such type of property, I'll show it in a moment, is, is either expected value or maximum. No, maximum, again, it's, uh, it is decomposable in that sense because maximum of maximum is a total maximum. I have a set of numbers and I separated some subsets, take maximum of each one of them, I take maximum of that, I'll get total max. It turns out that only these two have this property, which is com uh, this makes it very different for example, average value at risk doesn't have this property, and some other don't have this decomposability type of property, which makes it quite different the dynamic analysis of that from static one or from risk neutral one. Okay. No, this is a simple example of that, what I said. If I, for example, consider this one sided, I simply take conditional expectation here. If I want this, uh, this conditional average release, I simply take this again, this conditional expectation of that, and uh, this will be uh, analog of that. There are technical things here, right? Again, I don't want to go too much into technical things, but basically this intuition. Now, now I'll, uh, I'll start to talk about dynamics of that, and they, here it will be much more involved. I don't know if this uh, in the morning it was discussed multi-stage case. No, no, oh, bad. <laughs> then it's my responsibility to say something about that at least. Okay. If you say it first time, it's tough. Okay. So in dynamics, uh, there are many cases of decisions are made in stages. You have uh, some run process. This is corresponding uncertainty process, we model it as a random process, the data, how it's involved, evolved, right? And uh, you make decision a certain period of time. How you make decision? You make decision based on what you observed so far, right? We know the past, no, at least we're supposed to know the past. We don't know the future, right? When I teach time series analysis, I say, the first class, I say, if I knew the future, I'll be not standing here. We don't know the future, but what we assume in the modeling, and it's very different, it's not a trivial thing. Modeling, eh? I'll not talk about that, right? 
with a certain distribution of the process. We have random process here. Okay. This is a data that is coming in stages. And we assume certain type of probability distribution. It's, it's process. In theoretically, you can say, oh, this is each one of is a vector. In fact, I have this vector of large dimension. I put some probability on it, and that's of the story. It's not, in theoretically, I can do that, but it's not use practically useful. I th can think about that and sequential decision that I make there with the time. Okay? So, uh, in very abstract form, it's the corresponding problem is written here. I observe my data, all right? And I make the decision. I observe my data, and I look at the t stages ahead, say 120 stages, a lot, right? And in risk neutral case, I, comp I try to minimize it on average subject to feasibility constraints, okay? So in linear case, which is by itself is very difficult, the cost to go function said to be linear, and this couple of constraints that connect what happens today and what will happen tomorrow by linear inequalities. This is one possible way of writing it. At the first stage, at the first stage, I deterministic. This is it. when I start that. It's before I observed any data. Before I observed data, my decision is deterministic. After that, is every time, right? My decision depends on the data, on the process that I observed up to time. So the optimal solution of that type of problem is a policy or decision rules, decision rule. In other words, I have, if I suppose to solve that, I have to give to the user rule or policy what to do optimally for all possible realization of the data up to that time. It's possible to show for risk neutral case, these two formulations, what is called nested, nested and what I write the equivalent. In fact, it's not clear what I mean by nested here. But this is quite clear, at least mathematically, right? This is a function of my data, and this is infinite dimensional problem. The constraint, the feasibility constraint, say linear should be satisfied for every possible, or for almost every possible realization of the data. So how to solve this is a big question. I will not probably have much, I will not, it's by itself is a very big issue. But at least mathematically, this is reasonably well formulated problem. Of course, they should be measurable with some technical conditions and so on. But this is what is people call risk neutral formulation multi-stage problem. We minimize that the cost, the total cost here, one, it's possible to do, to do some other things, total cost on average subject to feasibility constraint. The question, it's, and the way how one can try to deal with that is by using dynamical equations. And in fact, the only way I, how I know some reasonable way to even to try to solve that by using dynamical programming. And again, if you see it's first time, it's not easy. Probably even doesn't make much sense. But basically what we do, we're going backward in time, summarizing all the cost. We sum, we're going, this, and this is why it's called, written in that form, nested form. We summarize, going backward and adding and adding, adding until we go to the first stage, okay? And until we go to the first stage where we have to solve this the first stage decision, and this will give until we get to the first, and then we have, we get, if we will be able to solve it, we have the first stage decision, which is deterministic. This is before we observed any data, okay? Now, if you look at that, these equations, it's terrible. This is classical dynamical equation, and uh, when I, I have to do that, it, I have to compute this conditional expectations here. It's all conditional. Uh, if you have this, any book on stochastic problem, you see it's represented by the tree. This is tree is a po what possibly can happen. You can go like that, like that, and every time at every note of the tree, you have to make decision, conditional observing what happened in the past, and looking in the future, for future, you only 
known, or rather is assumed certain distribution. Probably distribution. We don't know what future is. And this is what this dynamical equation represents. And why it's terrible, because it depends on what is my decision variables. They're sometimes called state variables. It's a little bit, OK, it's a little bit more involved. And my data. In this case, when I have my process dependent on each other, I have basically to remember all that what happened from the beginning in this. It's terrible because I cannot do that. How I can put that in a computer? I have to put somehow we'll put this equation in a computer. Okay? So the enormous simplification of that happens if I assume that my process independent from one stage to another, stochastically independent. It's very reasonably well formula, formulated property. If I assume that, then my cost to go function only depends on decision variables, which is enormous simplification. It's still not easy to solve. I don't have time to talk about that. Now, what happens if I replace this conditional expectations by risk measure? Why, one thing why, should, why, why I would like to do that, because for the same reason as before, because in this formulation, if I look at this formulation, it does not control any risk of that. We optimize, we minimize this on average. Apart from this infinite dimensional problem, it's not clear how to solve that. We minimize that on average. What really can happen if we look at this particular realization of this process, it's random, this has variability. It can be very different from the average. So I can be in trouble. So how to control the risk? And there's a lot of talking now about that. In two stages, this way we had this formulation. Right? We say, OK, we want, to this, we, have, we want to reach some type of compromise, how we minimize and minimize our average, and how we want to control this higher cost of the objective value. Right? We want to smooth it out. We don't want it with some probabilities. This uh, cost of this will go much bigger than it's on the average. Here it's much more difficult. Okay? But the idea is the same. As uh, we're going on with the, with the process, right? it can happen that for bad realization of the data, what the cost that we observe, and we observe the cost of what happened so far, right? can be much bigger than the average. So when we talk about the average, when we talk about the average, it's maybe it's moved out this large cost for some long period of time. But I don't want this cost of electricity, whatever, next month will be 10 times more than usual. And if the people, this people telling me, don't worry about that, but in 10 years it will smooth it out by average, uh, it's, I'll have some problems with that. So I want to this control the type of the risk at every period of time. This is a very natural thing, right? not on average. And here it's uh, this some strange things start to appear, which is uh, sometimes not even very intuitive. Okay. So first of all, I, by similarity with this risk neutral case, I can write something similar. Simply, simply instead of this condi taking conditional expectations, I will take conditional risk measures. If I have low invariant, this, it's always analog. Remember, this C1, this first one is deterministic. So it's, the, it's really the same as no unconditional. I simply write it for uniformity of notation. But basically, I try to do similar things. And the one thing is natural to take, I probably will take some compromise between minimizing it on average and trying to penalize the higher quantiles on that. This is what average value at risk is does. And uh, I have the conditional analog of that. Of course, the question how to choose these corresponding parameters here. It's not a simple question. I don't have time to talk about that, OK? But this is something very natural. And if I write it, if I write it in this conditional form, my goal 
I do, should not remember that I want to minimize the cost on average, but I try to control the higher risk at every stage. Please remember, this is very important. At every stage, I try to control this possible peaks of that, which will go much higher. And this is a, exactly this penalization of that, but average value is because it's penalized in some intuitive sense the high quantiles of my distribution. Okay. Now, what is immediately interesting is that if we look at here, when we talk about that, there were two equivalent formulations of that. We had nested formulation and this total one, the expected value, and they're equivalent. Right? How it's proved? It's proved by using the composability property of the expectation and the fact that one can interchange the minimum uh, the, in the expected value. This is how it's, it's basically a dynamical equation. For risk measure, it's much more complex. So in principle, if I take the sequence of conditional risk measures, I start with some risk measure, say convex combination of the expectation on average, this conditional analog, and I take a nested form of that. I apply it one after another. Here, I'll, let's for the sum. If I do it like that, I'll have this decomposability type of property. If I look at that, what I'll have at the end also will be risk measure. No, it's all assigned to that some number under certain condition. The point is that it's very complicated. It will be coherent risk measure. It's not difficult to show, but we will not have an, an explicit form. For example, if I, even if I'll take something simple here, relatively simple average value at risk, and I take nested of that, I will not get average value at risk here. So the problem with that, so the equivalence here will be to something which I cannot give very clear intuitive interpretation of that. Right? It's very complicated. It's not possible to write in a closed form. And this is actually objection of the, to this type of this modeling of that. People say, what is the meaning of that? What is the intuitive meaning of that? Mathematically, it's okay. Uh, it's not a simple question, and probably I will not have complete answer. If I'll ask me, my opinion is the meaning of that is irrele irrelevant. It's risk on risk, it doesn't matter. What I really try to do, I try to control the risk at every stage. That's it. Not more than that, not less than that. And it works, in some cases, work seems to be work reasonably well. To, to look at that, the total one doesn't make, it's not very interesting. What is that? It's some complicated thing and doesn't have clear intuitive interpretation. Now, because the alternative to that, from the beginning, to take, say, average value at risk and minimize that, if I'll do it like, if I'll try to do it like that, I'll don't, I'll not have decomposability property. I will not be able to write dynamical equation. I will not be able to solve it any reasonable way. And the, the interpretation of that will be probably not less questionable than I will have now. Right? So in some sense, this, for many reasons, this is the natural way how one can do that. By conditional, it, when you take this, Multi-stage problem, the conditional thing is everything. You look at the tree, you at a certain point, at a certain time at the stage, you observe the past, conditional on that, you look in the future. You already know what happened. And this will be very much related to what we talk about. We talk about time consistency. Okay? So this is exactly what I said. This is. If this we have some coherent risk measure, low environment coherent risk measure, that holds only in two cases. Very negative result. Mathematically true, right? What can we do? It's like that. So if, if I go back there, if I take the maximum of that, which is basically ro multi-stage robust optimization, then it will be maximum. If I take average of that, it will be risk neutral case. All between that is much more complex. Okay, now, 
Uh, maybe I should say a few words of connection between all of that and what the people to call today distributionally robust optimization. Remember by this duality that we had. There's two sides of the coin here, how I can look at that. I can assign, in static case, two-stage case, I can define some risk measure, coherent risk measure. It has dual representation. So I can look at that as distributionally robust, where I don't have the distribution, I have the whole class of distribution, and take the worst possible case. So by duality, that this, it's two like this coin so here. In static case, at least mathematically, it's quite clear. Right? In multi-stage, in dynamics, it's much more involved. And the reason of that is this, that this, I don't have this property anymore. This is the reason of that. So if I look now from distributionally robust point of view, how I even, what is the even reasonable formulation of that, right? Remember the solution of this type of, if I have risk, net, if I have risk neutral case, is a policy or decision rule. It's a function of my data, which should satisfy feasibility constraint. And this is the total cost of that. So it's, uh, this, I can look at this as a random variable, which depends on the policy or decision rule that I want to uh, decide. And in risk neutral case, I minimize that over all the pol policies. No, it should be feasible, it should be measurable, there's some technical details. But this is what, this, uh, for this very compact formulation of risk neutral case. What will happen in, uh, when I go to the dynamics? Now, I say, okay, as in the spirit of distributional robustness, I say, it's not just one distribution here, but I have a whole family of distributions, right? And I take the worst possible case. So this is my cost, my cost, and it depends on the policy. It's a function of the policy. Under certain condition, I can talk about the expected value of that with respect to the distribution, I take the maximum over certain family and then I minimize over these policies. Turns out this is not right formulation. Okay. Why it's not right? Again, if I look at the expected value of that, it has this decomposability property. Remember, we, I talked about it already several times. <coughs> what happens? This is my expect, this is expect value, expect value with respect to certain distribution of my process that I choose. Right? Then I can write it. Right? No, this is, a, of course, there's some technical question if it is well defined, but it's, it's okay, generally. The same, the same thing is here. Only I consider it for specific distribution. Now I take maximum of that. If I want to write, formulate it like this, right? I have a problem because the moment I want I like to take this inside this, I only have inequality. I don't have equality anymore. It will be generally will be inequality, and the reason for that, the solution of that can depend on a particular queue, on a particular distribution that I will have. Okay? Because of that, if I want to write that into nested form. And this, what I wrote here is analog of this, what I have here. It's analog of this, nested. Okay, this nested form, here it's simply written in dual, some sense in a dual form of this. Here it's written directly in the form of this maximum expectation. All right? What I will have, it will have at the end, if I take this nested form, it will be some function of that, some function of that under certain condition or technical condition that I need. It's possible to show that it will satisfy all these properties, so it's coherent risk function. So there exists some set of measures such that it will be equality, but it will be very different from what I started with, or can be very different from that. In fact, it's not easy to, uh, to see what it is, will be. It can be quite complicated. This is so-called rectangularity properties of that. There's uh, some results of that type. I don't have to look at that. In particular, it simpl all of that simplifies 
that if I consider these measures, which are direct products, right? This is analog of stage-wise independence. I consider direct products of that. Then this equation, but the basic thing still remains the same. At the end, right, I have an equality. And uh, it's, uh, if I, and it's not even completely clear what it is. In some very specific cases, right, I have this property of that rectangularity. It's the same. But it's very specific, some very specific cases of that. Okay. Now, I, I, I think at this point I stop. Right? We will talk, uh, we'll continue after the break. It's four o'clock. Okay.